Hi, thanks for joining our LinkedIn Live, an inside look the fundamentals of resume building. My name is Eric Helligy, and I'm the Director of Career Advising here at DeVry University. I have the honored role of helping support our career advisors who work directly with our students and alumni in their career development. I'm joined by my co-host, Amber Hornbeck. Amber, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Amber Hornbeck. I'm the Regional Manager of Career Advising at DeVry University. This is my sixth year with DeVry and my 12th year supporting career advising inside of higher education. Eric and I are also both certified professional resume writers, and we hope to share some of this great information with you all today. Absolutely. We're going to have a really insightful live event today, but we need your help. Go ahead and answer your questions about resumes in the chat, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. All right, let's get started. I wanted to first talk about a question that's not so commonly asked, but I know it's super important when we talk about resumes. Amber, what do you think the role of a resume is? That's a great question, Eric. And um, I think it's actually, there's a huge misconception about the role of your resume. I would say that most of us believe that the role of your resume is to land you a job. However, I'm here to tell you that it won't. The role of your resume is actually to get you the interview. That's right, the interview. So your resume should provide a historical review of experience and education, highlight professional achievements, and most importantly, outline to the reader or recruiter, why you? I love that you highlighted professional achievements. It's something that I don't see job seekers do enough in their resume. I think most typical job seekers focus on their job duties, right? Those things that are in the job description. But those uh, professional achievements are really what help you stand out amongst the competition. I know as a hiring manager myself, when I look at resumes, those are the first things I want to see because they tell me more about who you are and how you work within a professional setting. So Amber, let's dig a little deeper into these professional achievements. What are some questions you have job seekers review when they're trying to identify their own professional achievements? Yeah, that's correct. Um, I think a lot of job seekers struggle with identifying their achievement statements for their resume. Some really strong questions that I challenge my job seekers to consider when they are working on formulating the achievement statements would be, did you win any awards at work? Why or how were you selected for those awards? Maybe you were the sales associate of the month last June and you exceeded your plan by 17%. So ask yourself, how or why were you selected? How did you get there? Also, another question would be, did you accomplish any project goals? What was the outcome or business impact of that particular goal? Another great question to consider, did you receive any recommendations? What about positive feedback on your performance review? This is often forgotten about, but such a great tool to use when you're really trying to outline some of your achievement statements. And then last, how would others describe you? Or even what makes you different? How do you differentiate yourself from the competition? I love that you called out those, uh, those reviews. I know that in every role that I've had, there has been some type of re review process, whether it's annually, quarterly, monthly, um, that I need to review my past performance. And I'd love to take that time to reflect on if there were any achievements that I obtained, any projects that I finished, and really notating the impacts on the organization. I also love then it gets my manager a chance to describe and point out achievements that I may have missed. Um, so if you have any past reviews, take a look at those reviews and see if you can highlight and pick out any achievements in your past experiences. All right, Amber, so let's get through the, uh, the sections of a resume, right? Let's dive in deep to each part of a resume. And let's start at the very beginning with the introduction. What do you tell job seekers should go into this section? So your introduction needs to just be very clean and clear. Of course, you need to have your name bolded at the top of your resume in a larger font. You need to make sure that all of the professional contact information that you have listed is very easy to see and find. Recruiters shouldn't be looking for this. There shouldn't be multiple phone numbers or multiple email addresses. They should be able to easily contact you. 
Um, we also recommend um, city, state, zip code. And then if you do have a professional LinkedIn URL, you can hyperlink this at the top of your document, or you can even customize your LinkedIn URL um, and add it to the top of your introduction. Another thing you wanna make sure that you include in your introduction is a job target. You want to make sure that you have named your resume and that it aligns to the type of career and or industry that you're going to be applying to. This is going to be very important um, because it's really going to be the title head for the rest of the information inside of your document. I love the job target. You wouldn't write an academic paper without a job without a title, and you shouldn't write your resume without one either. So I love that you added that. All right. So after in the introduction section is normally uh, the summary of summary qualification. Now, I know a lot of us may be familiar with an objective statement, which was commonly used. We have transferred to the summary of qualifications. And the summary of qualifications is three to five bullet points that summarize and outline your unique skills, experience, and education to the reader. This is important because it's the top of your resume, which is most commonly read by recruiters. So you want to get to the point quickly and outline why they should hire you, why they should bring you in for that interview, like Amber pointed out. So highlighting those hard skills, those soft skills, that experience that's really going to make you unique is going to be important. Also, those achievement statements that we talked about earlier, it's a great place for those to be located within the summary qualifications. All right, Amber, so as we travel down the resume, normally the next section is experience. What do you tell job seekers should go into their experience section? Yes, absolutely. So your experience section is really your opportunity to shine and grab the reader's attention. It needs to be very clear and concise with the organization or the company name, your job title. It also needs to include both month and year for each position that you held. Um, there's a big difference between just listing years. It could be the difference of two months or 12 months. So I recommend to all of our job seekers that they do include month and year for each particular job. Also want to make sure, again, that the bullet points listed underneath this section really show how you were able to differentiate yourself. You don't want to just take your job description, copy and paste it into the bullets. You want to take some time to show the reader how you went above and beyond in your role. Something that we do recommend to our job seekers would be the STAR method. And STAR stands for Situation, Task, Action, and Result. This is a great tool and resource to use if you're struggling coming up with some of those achievement statements. I love using STAR because of the, the result, the R of STAR, right? I think most job seekers forget this when they're talking about their achievement statements or their resume. The outcome that you had, the impact to the business is so important to include. So awesome for giving that. All right, so let's talk about the education and training section. Um, this is similar to the, uh, the way that Amber outlined the experience section. You want to highlight your school or university, the degree you obtained, if you had a concentration or minor also include. If you're currently in school, you want to uh, post your uh, forecasted graduation date. If you have already graduated, go ahead and list that. If it is 10 years ago, go ahead and leave the graduation date off. It's no longer needed. I also like to recommend that if you are currently in school or recently graduated, listing your coursework is also a great ad. Um, but instead of just listing your coursework, go ahead and identify projects or assignments or special things you did within the classroom that really highlight your skills or experiences. This is great, especially for individuals who may not have a lot of work experience. You can use your school experience to showcase how you're relevant to the job you're applying to. All right, Amber, so let's talk about the last part, which is certifications and professional development. What should go in there? So certifications and professional development, it's a great section where you can really show the reader how you've went above and beyond in your specific profession or career outcome. Um, you want to make sure, however, that everything that you're listing is relevant to your career today. So for example, if you completed a cosmetology or maybe an HVAC certificate 10 years ago, and today you're applying for a job and entry level IT help desk, you're not going to include those different certifications in your document. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that all of the keywords are very relevant. We all know about applicant tracking systems and online applications and keywords have never been more important. So making sure that everything inside of your document, including certifications are relevant is going to be very important. 
We're going to get into some commonly asked questions next. But before we do, if you have any questions about resumes, go ahead and put those in the chat and we're going to get to as many as we can at the end. And so the first question that we want to answer that we get a lot is a back about that objective statement, right? And we talked a little bit about this with a summary of qualification. So the objective statement, for those of you who are unfamiliar with an objective statement, usually read seeking a opportunity in the field of human resources where I can use my skills of communication, leadership, um, and team, uh, team management um, in a new opportunity. You can see it's pretty vague, right? It doesn't tell a lot about the job seeker. And so instead we're moving towards a summary of qualification. But what I also love to add to the summary, summary of qualification area is a core competency section. I love this because it's a quick way to show your hard and soft skills to an employer. We know that when we read a job description, we often see those things called out. Employers are looking for specific skills from an applicant. And so the core competency section allows us to quickly identify and highlight those skills. So things like technology, language, soft skills that we want to highlight can go into your core competency section. If you don't have one today, think about adding one. All right, Amber, the next question we get is about listing hobbies or even pictures on the resume. What do you think about that? So hobbies and pictures, they should not be on your resume. You only have so much white space that's going to allow you to fit in keywords that are going to be so important for the industry or job that you are trying to direct your resume toward. Um, if you are really wanting to have a picture, I do recommend, as previously mentioned, you can include your URL for your LinkedIn. On your LinkedIn, you can include a professional headshot. That will also give the reader an opportunity to see some of the professional organizations or volunteer service that you have completed in the past. But you really want to save all the space on your resume and your document for those keywords that are going to be directed towards the job you're applying to. And I, I love that because we know that recruiters are already looking at LinkedIn to source candidates, to review candidates. So by giving you giving them your own LinkedIn URL, you're giving them an easy way to find out more information about you, which is awesome. All right. And so we also ask, I get a lot of questions about how long should my resume be? And I'm going to answer this in two different ways. The first one is it should be as long as needed to display your relevant information to a hiring manager, right? And again, relevant being that key word. We want to make sure the information we're adding to our resume is important for that individual to read about the position they're looking for. The second way is usually one to two pages is a pretty great length for a resume. One to two pages is enough space for individuals who are recent grads, five, 10 years of experience to highlight their relevant experience. We may see individuals who have uh, three pages or longer. Typically, they have many, many years of experience within the same industry, um, uh, applying for maybe an executive position or looking for a role in academia. So typically, one to two pages is, is, is a pretty good length for a resume. All right, Amber, we, let's talk about the design of a resume, the format of a resume. What do you think individuals should do when they're designing their resume? It really depends on the job or the industry that you're applying to. Uh, if we have a graphic design, media arts type individual that is looking for a new role, then of course their resume, their portfolio is going to have a creative spin. And that's okay. And it's going to be expected for the industry and the jobs that they're applying to. However, for the majority of us, a straight text document is going to be more valuable. It's going to upload better inside of an applicant tracking system. The keywords are going to be easily identified. You're going to be able to pull those out quickly for a recruiter. Um, if you also are uploading, we do recommend using a PDF document. Um, it's going to save some of the formatting inside of online applications and applicant tracking systems. So straight text is generally what we're looking for inside these documents. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about those resume killers, those typos, the grammar mistakes. Those are things that we hear from recruiters and hiring managers all the time that make your resume go into the no pile no matter what. And so what do you suggest, Amber, for students to make sure that they're not having any typos or grammar mistakes in their resume? Yeah, this is definitely a huge resume killer. Um, there's a great resource called Grammarly. You can do an easy copy paste of your document into their website. It'll pop up a few errors. You can you know, take a minute to read through it, proofread. 
However, also rule of thumb is always have at least three individuals go through and proofread your resume for you. This will make sure that it has been reviewed by multiple different people with different perceptions, especially if you've been working on your resume nonstop for a week, you might go right over some of these errors and not notice them. So it's always great to have some extra set of eyes review your document. And I always say, don't always trust the Microsoft Word uh, uh, typo check or, or word check, grammar check. It's not always accurate, right? It misses things. So having a human person like Amber suggested is always a safer bet. All right, so a question we always get to is, should we, we, should we be using words like I, me, my, or we in a resume? And so a resume is written in a uh, assumptive first person. An assumptive meaning the reader is assuming the document is about you because your name is the top of the resume. So we don't need to include words like I, me, or my. Instead, focus on strong action verbs that should begin your sentences and bullet points to set yourself up for success. Strong action verbs really help when you're talking about that STAR method that Amber referred to uh, before. So remove all of the I, me, or my and start with strong action verbs. All right, Amber, we also got a question about, should I be saying references available upon request in my resume? Uh, no, I know I mentioned this earlier, we wanna save the white space for those keywords, but references available upon request, you don't need to add it to your resume anymore. We all know when we're filling out an online application, you're more than likely going to have to add a few references. Your references should always be a separate document. It needs to match the same flow and format as your resume. You wanna make sure you're using the same font, the same text, you want to keep on brand. However, it needs to be a separate document. You wanna keep it on hand. You should have three to five professional references on a separate document available at all times during your job search. And I will also add our references should be, should be something that we um, secure, right? They, that's someone's personal information and we don't always know who's reading our resumes. We wanna make sure that's protected. And if we are sending out our references, we definitely want to give them a heads up that they could be called and contacted by an employer and give them details of the role that you're applying to so that when they get that phone call, they're prepared and know how to answer it. All right, so we have one last question that we're going to get to before we open it up to all of your questions. And this is probably one of my biggest pet peeves that I see in a resume. It's using abbreviations and acronyms. And I tell job seekers all the time to not use abbreviations and acronyms for two reasons. The first is you never know who's reading your resume. You may think that everyone in the industry should know what those abbreviations are, but you don't know who is reading your resume, if it's a recruiter, a secretary, a front end staff member. So you, you wanna make sure that you're spelling everything out to make sure everyone understands what you're talking about. The second reason is we know that uh, recruiters and hiring managers are searching for resumes using keywords. And so if you are to write out these words, it is more relevant of a job or keyword search that your resume can then pop it up in. So if you wanted to, what I suggest is to write out that word first and then use the parentheses and then put the abbreviation after that. Um, and that way you can use abbreviation further throughout the resume. All right. So now we want to get to your questions. If you haven't already, go ahead and enter those into the chat um, so that we can answer the questions you have about resume and job search. Um, I'm seeing a question come in here. Uh, I'm currently uh, enrolled in school for medical billing and coding. I have an extensive experience as a certified nursing assistant. When I revamp my resume after acquiring my certification on billing and coding, should I include my 17 years as a CNA? Amber, what do you think? So there's a lot of transferable skills that you've gained as a CNA. You already have experience in healthcare. It shows that you are familiar with medical terminology. There are tons of things that you can pull from your job as a CNA that you will want to include. I do recommend adding it. However, when you're listing out those bullet points underneath that job, you're going to make sure that you're articulating the specific attributes and accomplishments that are going to be more relevant to maybe a medical billing coding role. Um, this is, you know, something that we see every single day for those that are transitioning careers. However, you can't just leave off all of your information. Um, you want to make sure again that you're looking at how you can pull from your duties and try and relate to the job that you are applying to. 
Yeah, and we often call those transferable skills. So as Amber said, look for the skills that you're using today and how those can be transferred to the new role that you're applying to. All right, Ross asks, how do you avoid age discrimination in a resume? And what I would say to Ross is um, we always use a rule of thumb is if anything over 10 years, really think about the, the relevancy or need to put on the resume. For example, when we talk about experience, um, things you did 10 years ago, is it still relevant? Is it still needed? Especially when we talk about technology or any jobs in the IT field. It changes so rapidly that things that you worked on platforms that you used 10 years ago may no longer be relevant. So think about, is it needed to go on a resume? And with education as well, uh, whether you got your education 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you have that education, which is really all that's needed. What should be more important at that time is any experience that you acquired in that um, in the interim, right? So those are things that I always suggest people to do is look at the dates and look at things and whether they need to include it or not. Sarah asks, how do we turn military jobs into experience and education? What do you think, Amber? This is a great question. Um, we see it a lot, and it's very similar to my previous answer, but there's a lot of things that um, all of our service members have done and all of our veterans have done that we have to be able to pull transferable skills from. It's really breaking it down and, and taking it out of the military lingo um, and then focusing then on the civilian world. I think that there's a huge misconception that that transition doesn't always apply when I would argue there are probably more things that you have accomplished in your job um, as a service member or veteran that we can easily then transfer over, pull from your transferable skills, look at the leadership attributes, um, and it really also depends on the type of job you're applying to. Absolutely. I find that people either um, military or veteran individuals, they usually um, add too much to the resume and they don't help explain to someone who's not in a uh, uh, military what that means or they leave it off completely. So I think there is a balance that Amber talked about is that listing it is important, but making sure that you take away the jargon and you really make it uh, easy to read and simplified for the, the reader. Uh, thank you, Sarah, also for your service. Amy asks, um, are cover letters important? And this is one of my favorite questions. Um, I love cover letters, um, but we do hear from quite a few recruiters that they don't read them. They just look at their resume and they may skim them and they don't read them, but we also know that they can be used as a deciding factor. If they have two great candidates, two great resumes, a cover letter may be the, something that divides them. And so what I would say is whether you use a cover letter or not, make sure it's done properly, meaning it's targeted, it's relevant to the job. You're taking time to really think about the reader and what they want to see in a cover letter. Again, I know as a hiring manager, I can see when someone's taken time to write a really thought out cover letter and when they've just copied and pasted and used the same one over and over and over again. So I would always say, if you're gonna use a cover letter, make sure you do it correctly. All right, Kimberly asks, how does DeVry's Career Services help you with your resume? Do they help you create one or do they provide feedback? So that is a great question, Kimberly, but we will actually help you with both. So if you have a rough draft, we are more than happy to look through that, provide you feedback, give you some edit suggestions. If you have never created a resume, we have tons of different resume guides to help you get started. Just opening up Microsoft Word and starting to put in the different sections, I think you would be shocked at how easy it is to just plug them in and then work with your advisor along the way until it is finalized. Um, outside of that, we also offer a lot of resume webinars and tools and resources inside of Hire DeVry 2.0, um, which you all have access to inside of the student portal. I would also add that the career advisor isn't going to just focus on your resume, right? I love that our career advisors, they, they take a step back and they look at your personal brand. How are you communicating yourself to an employer? And they incorporate that into the resume and then the cover letter and then LinkedIn and the interview, right? It's We know, as Amber said, the resume isn't gonna get you a job. The resume is gonna get you an interview. You need to work on all those other components to really help and make sure that you are coming across as a qualified applicant. Yeah, that's great, Eric. Um, and then Corey T asked, in a summary statement needed for those who have professional experience in the field, they're job seeking in. So does he still need a summary statement? 
I always love a summer qualification. I think it's a great way to set the tone for the resume. And as I mentioned, it's at the top of the resume, right? And so we know when uh, a reader, they're gonna read that most likely first. And that sets the tone, that gives them an, an idea of who you are and why you're an ideal fit for this, uh, for this uh, position. What I would say, when we talk about targeting your resume, this is a section that I would always target and always review before sending my application or my resume into a, a job opportunity. The reason being, again, it's read first. So you want to make sure that you're setting the right tone for the reader. You're hitting them with a big impact when they begin reading your resume. Yeah, and I would add, Corey, that your summary is probably one of the most important parts of your resume. Most recruiters will spend three to five seconds scanning. So that summary right at the top, you really want to make sure that you are selling why you are the best candidate for that job. Absolutely. Sarah asks, what if we can't find references? Amber, what, do, what would you suggest? So there's a different, you know, a few different routes you can take. Um, look for, you know, previous managers, of course, first. If you're unable to, you can also use your peers. You can use colleagues as references. A reference can be anyone that knows your character and your ability to get work done. If you haven't had a job, think about previous professors that you have had class with, maybe you've developed a great rapport with, um, or even coaches or teachers from your past. And I would start having those conversations now, right? Talking to your network um, and, and uncovering their interest in being a reference and how they feel about being a reference um, and, and prepping them for the ability for them to be a reference in the future. All right. So and then we have Thomas who asked, I'm a recent project management grad, so no previous experience. I'm trying to break into the field. How do I get someone's attention? Any advice? I love this question um, and I would answer it. I could answer it all day long, but I think the most important thing is networking, right? Networking is gonna help introduce you to contacts. And we know the best way or easiest way, one of the easiest ways to find a job is through your current network. People like to hire who they know. Um, and so having conversations, asking for informational interviews. And I'll take a little aside to talk about informational interviews because I love them so much. An informational interview is not a job interview. It's an interview to obtain more information, more data, more resources with someone in a current role or organization or industry that you're interested in, right? So it's meeting them for coffee. It's sending them an email with questions. It's asking to meet with them face-to-face -face or over the phone, right? You're asking for information about who they are. And I love this because not everyone may have a job that they can offer you or provide to you, but everyone should have information or insights into how to help you get ahead. So I love the idea of doing that. I will also say if you are a DeVry student or alumni, we are partnering with an organization to help us identify micro internships. And micro internships are for students as well as alumni. And these are short term contract type positions that have employers who need help with a project looking for students or alumni to complete those. And so it's a great way for someone who may not be able to do a traditional, um, a traditional internship be able to complete something easily and quickly to help up their resume and find network connections. I see Melvin asked, what if you have a gap in your work history? What do you think, Amber? So this is a hard one, right? But I think it's, you know, in today's age, more and more common to have a gap. I think there are a few things you can do. You know, one, if you are attending school, make sure that that is highlighted. Make sure that you are listing out your coursework that you've completed, maybe any major projects. What was your role in that project? Um, I think second is to look at what were you doing during that time? Were you volunteering? Were there any professional associations that you were a part of? There's different things that you can try and fill in on that resume to be able to speak to in an interview setting. You just want to make sure that if asked in the interview setting, you're able to speak through that timeline and really focus on what was achieved. And I, I would I would add to that practice, right? As Amber said, you want to be able to address that, and sometimes it can be a little uncomfortable, right? So if you practice either with yourself or with a friend or family member, what you would say if asked, it will help that come across more confidently um, and more coherently. All right. So I see Jamal has a question. I'm currently working um, on my MBA, 
I'm in the finance field. I have extensive accounting and finance experience. How to include that and what's the page limit? So Jamal, there's a lot of unknown factors with that. I, I love that you're currently working in the field. Um, I guess the question I would ask is if you are obtaining your MBA, is that the continued field you want to work in, accounting and finance? And if so, you want to highlight your achievements that you obtained while working in those, in those roles, if you wanted to maybe advance in that field. If you wanted to career change, I think about, look at those transferable skills that Amber talked about before, right? What are you currently doing in the accounting and finance field that you can use in your desired new field and point those things out. As far as the page limit, as I said previously, it's all about the relevant experience. Um, I would assume one to two pages, but it really de depends on what experience you have and what you can highlight and showcase to an employer. All right, so we have got to all the questions that we can get to for our time today. Thank you so much for attending our LinkedIn Live. If you are a student or alumni of DeVry University, feel free to meet with Career Services to get help on your resume or other job search information. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn to get more updates on our LinkedIn Live. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone, have a great rest of the day.